Many of us play Call of Duty Zombies mode just to smash some brains, but Treyarch took the extra step to create an entire story around this mode. And it's quite a complex story, spanning from the early days of Aether with Call of Duty World at War, to the Dark Aether storyline from Black Ops Cold War and Vanguard. If you haven't played the latest Call of Duty yet, don't worry, there won't be any major spoilers. The story of Vanguard is a prequel to the Dark Aether story, but we'll get to that later. I'm Camille Salzer Hadaway, and this is the complete timeline of Call of Duty Zombies Mode. The story of Call of Duty Zombie Mode is quite long and complex. For the sake of clarity, some events will not be featured in this video. But if you're curious about the Aether story and would like a deeper dive into this particular area, check out our complete Call of Duty Black Ops Zombies Aether timeline video. The zombies story begins before humans exist on Earth. At the beginning of time, there are only two things, the fabric of reality itself, known as Aether, and the keepers who watch over it. The keepers are creatures with infinite wisdom. They watch over the world, foreseeing its future and destruction. These keepers designed the Summoning Key, a powerful artifact allowing them to create Agartha, a physical manifestation of Aether. Agartha is a distinct dimension, with a house we will talk about a little later. Some members of the Keepers start to experiment with Dark Aether, the opposite force of Aether. Progressively, the Dark Aether corrupts the Keepers working on it. The corrupted Keepers conduct experiments that lead to the creation of the Aether Pyramid, an artifact that can control reality itself. A war for Agartha breaks out between the corrupted and the non-corrupted Keepers. Dr. Monty leads the charge with the Keepers, while the Shadow Man led the corrupted ones. As they are facing defeat, the corrupted Keepers take the Aether Pyramid and hide it on the moon. The Keepers banish them from Argatha, forcing the corrupted to live in the Dark Aether for eternity. This long exposure to the Dark Aether turns the corrupted Keepers into monsters, called Apothecons. The Apothecons eventually find out that the Earth has a gateway to Agartha, their former home. To join Earth and find the way to Agartha, the Apothecons launch several meteors at the planet containing Element 115. They believe that humans will eventually try to use Element 115's power, which would cause a rift to open up between Dark Aether and Earth. April 14, 1885, Purgatory Point, Old West. Jebediah Brown, a blacksmith from a small mining town, notices something is affecting the workers of the mine. One of them even turns into a zombie and kills his mother. Determined to unveil the mysteries surrounding the miners, Jebediah goes into the mine himself to see what's going on. He returns to the surface after what he thinks was a couple of hours. He actually spent five days in the mine. April 19, 1885. Jebediah has a vision in his sleep. Two angels ask him to build a machine that could give him great power against what's coming. As a result, Jebediah builds the Pack-a-Punch machine. This device, which upgrades weapons, has great success in Jebediah's town. June 30th, 1885. Jebediah has a second vision. This time, the angels want him to create an Agarthan device with three components, the blood of an Apocathon Elder God, an elemental shard, and a metallic real vessel. Jebediah has no clue how to find the blood of an Elder God or how to create an elemental shard. But, as a blacksmith, he crafts a metallic real vessel. July 21st, 1885. The angels come to Jeb one last time. They want him to place the real vessel inside his pack punch machine. As Jebediah obeys the angels, the entire town of Purgatory Point is teleported below Angola, deep beneath the surface. Hordes of zombies overrun the city, killing every inhabitant, Jeb included. May 10th, 1931. A large deposit of element 115 is found in Brislow, Germany. Dr. Ludwig Maxis forms group 935, a scientific group, to study this mysterious material. Dr. Maxis wants to use element 115 to create advanced technology and improve the human condition. He invites his colleague, Dr. Edward Richtofen, to work with him on this project. 1939. Dr. Maxis and Richtofen continue their experiments with element 115. They are working on a teleportation system, but the chemical composition of the subjects change after teleportation, leaving them catatonic and changed. If transforming people into zombies was not the main goal of Dr. Maxis and Richtofen, this project is interesting for Nazi Germany, 
who could use the extra soldiers to win the war. The Reich funds Group 935 so they could continue their research. As Dr. Maxis continues working with Nazi Germany on the undead army, Dr. Richthofen starts experimenting on human teleportation behind his colleague's back. January 4th, 1940. Dr. Richthofen finds out how to teleport a human. He is so confident in his results that he volunteers himself to be teleported. He ends up on the moon, where he finds a strange object, the Ether Pyramid, which the Apothecons hid a long time ago. As he touches the pyramid, Richtofen is electrocuted and starts hearing voices of the corrupted, including the Shadow Man. Like everyone else corrupted by Dark Ether, Richtofen now has a single obsession, find Agartha. Richtofen is teleported back to Earth. He wants to build a station on the moon called Griffin Station to study the Ether Pyramid. However, Dr. Maxis has other priorities, collaborating with Nazi Germany on the Undead Army. February 1st, 1942. Griffin Station is complete. Richthofen sends a team to the moon to find a way to activate the Ether Pyramid, which he called MPD, Moon Pyramid Device. May 15th, 1942. Group 935 operatives find several relics from an American town in Africa. Among them, pieces of Jebediah Brown's Pack-a-Punch machine. Richtofen gets his hand on these artifacts, as well as the real vessel and the plans for the Agarthan device. 1942. At Griffin Station, scientists are still scratching their heads over how to power the Ether Pyramid. One of them kills a rat near the machine, which begins to fill its tank and charge the machine. Richtofen decides to send soldiers and scientists to be sacrificed, so they could charge the pyramid. At the end of 1942. Germany asked Maxis to transfer to another facility so he could focus on creating the undead army. Despite worrying that Element 115 is changing Richtofen's behavior, Maxis leaves his daughter Samantha in Richtofen's care while he is away. Well, that's a bad idea. August 1945. Group 935 begins testing on three prisoners of war, Nikolai Belinsky, Pablo Marinus, and Takeo Masaki. During the experiments, Richtofen extracts Pablo Marinus' spleen to see if that is where the barrier to unlock the human mind is located. It is not. So spleenless, Pablo is dumped into the river. Not quite dead, however, Pablo survives and swims back to the Siberian facility, where he stays for the next 20 years. Richtofen uses other test subjects, Teg Dempsey, leader of the Marine Recon Team, and Samantha, Dr. Maxis' daughter. Richtofen eventually finds out how to extract souls to create a processed rock of element 115. With three souls, only one more needed. Richtofen adds his own soul into the mix, injecting it into the rock, which turns into a shard of glass. October 1945. The war is over. As Nazi Germany doesn't need an undead army anymore, Dr. Maxis returns to Group 935's main base, called Der Ries. Richtofen joins him soon after with his test subjects and Maxis's daughter, Samantha. October 12, 1945. The scientists on Griffin Station successfully power the Ether Pyramid. They inform Richtofen that everything is ready and are now waiting for the conduit. October 13, 1945. Maxis and Richtofen continue their work on the teleportation machine. During one experiment, Maxis uses Samantha's dog as a test subject. Samantha runs to her dog, and as Maxis chases her daughter, Richtofen locks them all inside the teleportation chamber. Maxis is teleported to the crazy place, where he learns to fuse himself into electrical devices. Samantha ends up at Griffin Station. In a panic, she runs into the Moon Pyramid device. This encounter corrupts the girl with dark ether, but also grants her the power to control the zombies. Richtofen cannot let her rule the world, so he asks his scientists to teleport Maxis to the Griffin Station so he can get his daughter out of the pyramid. Maxis joins the station and asks his daughter to come out of the pyramid. As she steps foot on the floor, Maxis asks her to kill everyone in Group 935. Maxis kills himself and merges with the technology of Griffin Station. Samantha jumps back into the Ether Pyramid and unleashes the undead upon the base, killing everyone. October 14, 1945. An outbreak occurs at Group 935's main base, Deris. Richtofen awakes Dempsey, Takeo, and Nikolai. They have no memory who they are or who Richtofen is, but agree to help him. The four of them will later be known as the Ultimus. November 1945. Ultimus Richtofen wants to go back to the moon to stop Samantha. However, the teleportation goes wrong and Richtofen ends up in one of Group 935's facility in Russia. 
but in 1963. He drops his diary, which will later be retrieved by the Soviet Union. This is where the story gets even crazier. And I'm not even talking about the space monkey zombies. October 1963. The Russians find Richtofen's diary. They become corrupted by Samantha's voice, which asks them to create a rift so she could return to Earth. When Ultimus traveled through time and space the first time, it created temporal rifts across all dimensions. Dr. Monty, the leader of the Keepers, decided to step in and help Group 935. August 3, 1963. The United States begins its own experiment with the undead. They create their own teleportation machine in the Groom Lake facility based on Group 935's research. As the scientists are building a portal between Groom Lake and the moon, they accidentally teleport Ultimus Richtofen, Dempsey, Nikolai, and Takeo. They become test subjects for the scientists and turn into zombies. October 13, 1963. Undead Richtofen escapes and finds his old body in a catatonic state. Richtofen reemerges his soul with his body, awakening him from his coma. October 13, 2025. Ultimus Richtofen reaches Griffin Station. He uses the terminal to power up the Vril vessel and merge it with the focusing stone. Maxis and Samantha try to stop him, but Richtofen achieves his grand scheme and switches his soul with Samantha. The girl is now trapped in Richtofen's body, while Ultimus gains full control of the zombies and the ether. Maxis, now corrupted by Dark Aether, manages to get Samantha out of Richtofen's body to join him in Agartha. Richtofen's body returns to a catatonic state without a soul in it. Ultimus Demzi, Nikolai, and Takeo decide to help Maxis stop Richtofen. They launch three missiles to Earth to sever the link between the planet and Agartha. But they mess up their calculations, and the missiles end up destroying the planet. Richtofen no longer controls the ether, but he still is in control of the hordes of zombies that are now all over the Earth. The missiles leave Earth as a wasteland. Zombies are crawling all around while civilization collapses. Maxis forms a group to help him with his plan B. Activate global polarization devices and open a gate to Agartha. Officially, this would allow him to overpower Richtofen and heal the Earth. But his real plans are different. Maxis wants to reunite with his daughter Samantha, who is in Agartha. Unbeknownst to his followers, opening a portal to Agartha would result in the destruction of Earth. Meanwhile, Ultimus Richtofen is not satisfied with losing his power over the Aether. Of course, he still has control over the undead, but that's far from controlling the universe. He plans to activate the global polarization devices just like Maxis, which would allow him to create a direct gateway to Agartha and his enemy, Samantha. To create an army to help him, Richtofen has an advantage over Maxis. He can communicate with anyone who has eaten zombie flesh. Now, who would eat zombie flesh, you wonder? Well, a group of survivors does. They call themselves the Flesh. Eventually, a battle breaks out between Maxis's followers and the Flesh, leaving only a few survivors. 2035, four survivors team up. Marlton Johnson, Abigail Misty Briarton, Russman, and Samuel J. Stullinger, a former member of the Flesh. The four of them will later be known as Victus. October 21st, 2035. Maxis contacts Victus to let them know a polarization device is hiding at Hanford site. Richtofen, who could speak to the mind of Samuel J. Stullinger, asks him to sabotage Maxis's plan and deliver him the device instead. Victus sides with Maxis and brings back the first polarization device. October 22nd, 2035. Richtofen teleports Victus to a skyscraper in Shanghai. He tries to persuade the team to side with him and gain control over the second tower located there. Victus chose to follow Maxis instead and activate the second polarization device. January 19th, 2036. With all three polarization devices activated, Maxis gains control of the ether and opens up a gateway to Agartha. He could finally reunite with his daughter, Samantha. With his powers, he could also punish his nemesis, trapping Ultimus Richtofen's soul inside a zombie, creating Undead Richtofen. This is almost a happy ending, except that the Earth is completely destroyed. Now stay with me, because the story gets even more complex. There are alternate dimensions. MCU baby, when Maxis destroys the Earth, 
Samantha realizes her father is corrupted by the Dark Aether. She reaches out to an alternate version of Maxis residing in Dimension 63. Alternate versions of characters we already know are called Primus. In Dimension 63, there is an alternate version of Dr. Edward Richtofen. Since he was never in contact with Dark Aether, Primus Richtofen is still a good guy and wants to make things right. However, things aren't as bright for Maxis. He is completely obsessed with Samantha, his daughter from another dimension, who needs his help to escape Agartha. Dimension 63, June 4th, 1918. After Group 935 digs up large deposits of Element 1105 from northern France, the material awakens undead knights from the Great War. Maxis turns catatonic from his interaction with Element 105, so Richtofen removes his brain from his body before his friend turns into a zombie. On the battlefield, Richtofen meets three spies we know from the original dimension, Tank Dempsey, Nikolai Belinsky, and Takeo Misaki. They manage to free Samantha, who sends them to their next destination. Meanwhile, Maxis's brain arrives in Agartha. Dr. Monty, the keeper we talked about earlier, cleans the brain of any dark ether corruption. He wants to build a perfect world and ask Maxis to find a book called the Cronorium, which leads to an artifact known as the Summoning Key. Maxis relays a task to Richtofen and his crew. Primus Richtofen manages to reach out to his undead self of the original timeline. He asks him to pursue Victus. At the same time, as he could speak to the mind of Stollinger, he instructs him to convince Victus to follow his plans. December 31st, 1933. The Shadow Man is setting up a plan to stop Primus Richtofen. He corrupts the Warden of Alcatraz and creates a pocket dimension there. He traps the soul of four mobsters in prison and arranges for their souls to be tortured forever. July 4th, 1941. Victus secures the Cronorium for Richtofen, who just built a new lab in Alcatraz. Richtofen reads the Cronorium and travels through time a couple of times to collect blood vials of Victus. He even travels further back in time to secure two of the blood vials by giving them to a younger version of himself. Once Richtofen is done jumping through time and space, he comes back to Victus and puts them in cryogenic sleep, preserving them for when they are needed next. April 21st, 1944. Richtofen sets sail to his next destination, Morg City, in Dimension 63. The summoning key is locked inside a crate sealed with magic, preventing him from taking it. In Mork City, we meet a character we haven't seen in a long time, the Shadow Man. The leader of the Apothecons manipulates locals into using the summoning key and unleashing Apothecons upon the city. The Keepers arrive to contain the threat and manage to trap the Shadow Man inside the summoning key. Richtofen then swipes the key from the Keepers and jumps into another dimension, Dimension 2210. There, Richtofen snatches the soul of an innocent version of himself called Eddie. I'm so sorry. I really don't have time to explain. I have a universe to set right. Thank you, and goodbye. Primus Richtofen travels to the Ultimus timeline, where he meets Ultimus Richtofen. Primus kills the alternate version of himself, creating fractures across space and time. He tells the other Primus that they need to retrieve the souls of the Ultimus to break the chain of events leading to the destruction of Earth. Next up on the kill list is Ultimus Demzy. He is lying inside a cryostasis pod carried by a Group 935 truck. The group is sending Ultimus Demzy to Griffin Station on the moon. Primus Richtofen poses as his ultimate self to redirect the rocket containing Demzy to return to Earth. Primus uses the Viril device from the cryopod to invoke a Keeper, who teleports the Aether Pyramid from Griffin Station to their location. However, the Keeper gets corrupted by the Dark Aether in the process. Primus uses the summoning key to activate the Aether Pyramid. He launches dozens of rockets to the moon, destroying Griffin Station and all of the Group 935 members within it. Primus Richtofen reveals to his Primus fellows that his plan is to kill all of their Ultimus counterparts and preserve their souls inside the summoning key. Each Primus then proceeds to kill their Ultimus self. While on their manhunt, Primus takes the time to teleport Primus Richtofen before he acquires the summoning key. He receives the blood samples from Victus and Primus before teleporting again. With all of the Ultimus souls collected, Primus Richtofen sends them to Agartha. Monty turns them into children and they join Samantha and Eddie in the house. As their mission is now complete, Primus gets back to the house in Agartha. 
Maxis hears the voice of the Shadow Man from within the summoning key, begging for his help. Maxis grabs the artifact, releases the Shadow Man, and becomes trapped inside the key. The Shadow Man opens a gateway for the Apothecons who corrupt Agartha. An Apothecon sun rises above Agartha, an epic battle ensues, Primus defeats the Shadow Man, and Maxis destroys the Apothecon sun, the Apothecons, and all traces of element 115 from the final universe. After the battle, Monty realizes that Primus drank the blood of their counterparts in realities that are closed off. This creates a paradox, preventing Primus from fading out of existence. Monty sends Primus back to 1294 during the Great War between humans and Apothecons. There, they save Pablo Marinus before Ritofen gets him and pulls out his spleen. Saving Marinus creates an endless time loop trapping Primus. It turns out Monty was a bad guy all along and didn't really want to create a perfect world. The fate of humanity is doomed to relive the same cycle over and over again as soon as element 115 is discovered. The only way to stop the cycle is to purge element 115 from existence before humans could find it. July 4th, 1941. Primus Richtofen starts a plan to break the cycle. Pablo Marinus gives him an elemental gem, and Richtofen teleports to the Alcatraz pocket dimension. Primus Richtofen will now be known as post-Great War Richtofen. In the Alcatraz pocket dimension, the four mobsters are living in a perpetual loop and have no memory of what happened in the past. Only one of them remembers everything, Albert Arlington. Post-Great War, Richtofen arrives at the Alcatraz facility, where he meets Primus Richtofen, reading the Chronorium before his trip to the Morgue City. Primus Richtofen gives Post-Great War Richtofen the Victus blood samples before the latter leaves the dimension. As Primus was also leaving Alcatraz, the Warden destroys the Rift, trapping Primus in the pocket dimension. The Warden wants to use the blood of Primus to power a gateway for the Shadow Man and the Apocathons. Arlington, whose spirit took the form of a seagull for some reason, opens the cells holding Primus. They fight the Warden, who becomes a huge zombie. Eventually, post-Great War Richtofen steps out of a hidden cryopod, joins the fight, and uses the elemental gem to kill the Warden and his zombies. Post-Great War Richtofen advises Primus Nikolai to read the Chronorium, saying that the future has changed. Richtofen states that the cycle is now broken and that Primus no longer need the blood vials to stay alive. Post-Great War Richtofen takes the summoning key and goes through a portal with Primus, leaving Primus Richtofen to die in the collapsing Alcatraz pocket dimension. 1963. After leaving Alcatraz, Primus Nikolai, Dempsey, Takeo, and post-Great War Richtofen arrive at Groom Lake. As Primus Richtofen is now dead, Primus Nikolai becomes the leader of the group. The Primus meet their ultimate selves and warn them about the upcoming war. October 13th, 2025. Primus and Ultimus arrive at Camp Edward, Nevada. To break the never-ending loop, they need the elemental shard locked inside the American Pyramid device a machine based off the Aether Pyramid. After they retrieve the elemental shard, Maxis calls, saying it was too late. Monty, who was a bad guy all along, turns into his true form. Maxis manages to teleport Samantha and Eddie away before Monty devours him. Samantha doesn't like seeing her father getting eaten alive by Monty. I mean, who would? So she swears she will get revenge, kill Monty, and burn the house to the ground. After the events at Camp Edward, Primus, Ultimus, Samantha, and Eddie settle down around a campfire. Primus Nikolai explains that the Great War, the Apothecons, the Keepers, the Dark Aether, the Shadow Man, and Monty are just legends and tales from the Chronorium. Both the Shadow Man and Monty were corrupted by the Dark Aether, one from his own ambition and the other while desperately trying to save his friend. The only great war is the one everyone is fighting against themselves. Everyone goes to bed with these words of wisdom. At least that's what it seems like at first. In reality, all the drinks were poisoned by Primus Nikolai and everyone dies except Ultimus Richtofen as Nikolai needs him to contact Victus. Richtofen reaches out to Victus. They arrive in group 935's Siberian facility where they meet Pablo Marinus. Together, Victus and Marinus build an Agarthian device for Richtofen. Marinus assembles the Vril vessel hidden within the facility with the elemental shard sent by Primus Nikolai. They also have Apocathon blood from the Ascension facility. Victus activates the Agarthian device, which starts to evolve and affect all of the elemental 115 in the area. 
Pablo Marinas uses the device to open a portal leading to the Great War and leaves to help Primus Richtofen break the cycle. Victus keeps the Agarthian device and brings it to Primus Nikolai. Nikolai proceeds to destroy the summoning key with the help of the Agarthian device, causing the destruction of reality. Everything disappears, including Victus, the zombies, the Apocathons, Element 115, and Monty himself. Everything that came from the Aether is now banished to the Dark Aether. The last piece of the puzzle was the death of Primus Nikolai. He asks Samantha to kill him, leaving her and Eddie alone. The two children hold hands and walk together out to the Dark Aether into a new universe. With the destruction of the Summoning Key, every universe impacted by the Aether story is banished into the Dark Aether. This causes an apparition of the Elder Gods to appear. The Elder Gods are powerful beings who fight each other for power. One of them, Cordifex, is particularly fond of war and wants to rule over the Dark Aether by himself. The Supreme Commander of the Night Legions, Nordicus, joined Cordifex in his wars. But as victory was getting close, a resistance formed against Cordifex. Belakar the Warlock, Syraxxus the Shadow, and Invictor the Destroyer are part of this resistance. Seeing that Cordifex was going to lose, Nordicus switched sides and betrayed his former ally. When these Elder Gods are not at war, they influence human civilization on Earth. Belakar the Warlock is a fan of Mayans, while Cordifex prefers the Egyptians and their pharaohs. Also, each of the five Elder Gods sent one artifact to Earth. April 1939. On Earth, World War II is raging. The Nazis are losing the war and desperate to win by any means. The Reich launches several programs to find new ways to win the war. One of them is Uranverin, a program dedicated to atomic research and uranium enrichment. Summer 1943. Doctors Ulrich Vogel and Lucas Kurtz from the Uranverin program develop a massive particle accelerator and collider called Cyclotron. They set up operations in a site located in Morasco, Poland. Their project will be known as Project End Station. Another Nazi project is Die Wahrheit, the truth in German. This program is dedicated to finding ancient mythological artifacts proving the existence of the Nazis' Aryan master race. Oberführer Wolfram von List leads this SS battalion. September 1943. To find the ancient artifacts that will supposedly prove the Nazi supremacy, von List recruits several professionals. Among them is Professor Gabriel Kraft, a demonologist. Kraft declines to work for the Reich, but von List doesn't give him much of a choice. He kills his assistant and warns the demonologist that his wife is next if he doesn't cooperate. Kraft joins Divar Height, but swears to get revenge. March 7, 1944. As Vogel and Kurtz are performing their 12th test on the cyclotron, an accident happens. A rift between Earth and the Dark Aether is inadvertently created. The undead come through the gateway, and everyone near the cyclotron turns into a zombie. Over the next few days, Vogel is looking for a way to unzombify his former colleagues. He believes that if he could control the effects of Dark Aether on humans, he could weaponize it and create an army of undead soldiers able to follow orders and save the Reich. At the same time, the Elder God's artifact in Von List's possession react to the incident that just happened with the Cyclotron. Through his artifact, Cordifix grants Von List his power to raise the dead back to life. Von List promptly goes to Stralingard to try his new power and raises an army of undead in the service of the Reich. Kraft, the demonologist that doesn't like Von List, sends a distress call to the Allied Special Forces. They reach Stralingard and fight against the zombies where several portals appear. They end up in various places at war, such as Paris, Normandy, and France, and an army camp in Japan. Noctis, Syrix, Belkar, and Invictus each bond to Allied operatives through their artifacts. They are now fighting against Von List, and therefore against Cordifix and his evil plans. March 16, 1944. The Nazis discover an element unknown to mankind near the cyclotron. They call it Exo Element 1. April 3, 1944. Vogel completes a decontamination chamber meant to restore the brain activity of the zombies. The chamber removes Exo-Element 1 from the brains of the zombies, reducing their violent tendencies and restoring some brain functions. However, this is not enough to turn zombies back into real humans. 
August 1944. The war is not looking good for the Nazis. Adolf Hitler tasks Vogel to weaponize their findings and bring him the army of undead soldiers. Late 1944. Project End Station expands its activities with a new facility located beneath Berlin. They are able to open and sustain a rift leading directly to the dark ether. November 15, 1944. Kurtz develops lures and a harvester able to collect Exo Element 1 from specific dark ether entities called Tempests. November 16, 1944. Vogel creates a machine to open portals to the dark ether. December 14, 1944. Vogel and the Third Reich begin Operation Boulder. After studying the Dark Aether, Vogel proposes a plan to send an army to the Dark Aether to summon them at an opportune time to win the war. January 27, 1945. Task Force Balder, under the command of Gruppenführer Muller, arrives at the Morasco facility. Vogel sends instructions in Berlin on how to open the portal and orders all personnel to evacuate the Morasco facility. He asks Kurtz, who stays behind, to take care of his daughter Angelica. Task Force Boulder crosses the portal to the Dark Aether, causing Exo Element 1 to contaminate the facility. Vogel stays in the building to secure their travel through the Dark Aether. However, this journey is not without consequence for the Task Force who become corrupted. February 3rd, 1945. The Red Army arrives at the Morasco facility. They film everything, from the portal to the Dark Aether, to their battle against the zombies. These film reels will later be sent to the Soviet archives, where they remain hidden for almost four decades. February 10th, 1945. NKV Colonel Pavel Lazarev leads the cleanup operation of the Morasco facility. He asks Sergeant Kazimir Zykov, a soldier with knowledge of German engineering, to turn down the cyclotron. Zykov manages to stop the machine, but is sent into the dark either. February 21st, 1945. Kurtz and Vogel's daughter, Angelica, are captured by the Red Army. Colonel Lazarez threatens to kill Angelica if Kurtz doesn't reveal the names and location of the end station scientist. Kurtz cooperates, and Lazarez lets them live in the Soviet Union, but under different names. Kurtz is now Ivan Valentin, while Angelica Vogel becomes Alexandra Valentina. August 30th, 1975, KGB Chairman Yuri Andropov creates the Omega Group, a division specialized in the study and weaponization of psychotronic abilities, ranging from biocommunications to bioenergetics. March 1983, U.S. President Ronald Reagan announces the Strategic Defense Initiative, a missile defense system to protect the USA from nuclear weapon attacks. In response, KGB Chairman Viktor Chebrikov gave the lead of Omega Group to Colonel Lev Kravchenko. Dr. Alexandra Valentina joins Omega to help with their psychotronics research. Dr. William Peck, an American who defected to the Soviet Union, joins as Omega Group's exoscientific phenomena research lead. The thing is, Valentina is not alone in her head. Ever since she was a child, she has been visited by the Forsaken, a mysterious character who claims to be her father. He guides her to complete Operation Boulder and open a portal to the Dark Aether, and shows her where to find the end station film reels when she joins the KGB. July 15, 1983. Valentina shows the end station film reels to Kravchenko. The colonel immediately informs his hierarchy, who authorizes Omega Group to weaponize the findings of Project End Station and the Cyclotron. The new operation is called Operatia Grobovchik, or Operation Undertaker. August 1983. Omega Group secures the End Station facility in Morasco. November 1st, 1983. Omega Group, with the help of Valentina and Peck, reactivate the Cyclotron. Two officers, Medvedev and Orlov, activate the machine. They are successful, but Orloff is turned into a powerful zombie called Megaton. The reactivation of the cyclotron creates dimensional breaches and opens several portals, filling the Moresca facility with zombies. November 3rd, 1983. The sudden appearance of dimensional breaches doesn't go unnoticed. Ronald Reagan tasks U.S. Secretary of Defense Caspar Winberger and Director of the CIA William Casey to find a way to contain and suppress the threat. November 5, 1983, CIA Director William Casey creates the Office of Requiem. 
The Associate Deputy Director of the Directorate of Science and Technology at the CIA becomes the leader of this group. Under his leadership, four departments are created. Field Operations, led by Special Operations Officer Gregory Weaver, Containment and Security, led by Major Mackenzie Carver, Unnatural Science, led by Dr. Elizabeth Gray, and Energy Research, led by Dr. Oscar Strauss, a former member of Project End Station who joined the United States after the war. Meanwhile, an agent at the West Germany Federal Intelligence Service, called Samantha Maxis, gets information from her KGB contact. The Russians dug up from their archives something called End Station, a project from World War II that happened in Poland. Maxis gets footage of the End Station accident and sends it to the CIA. Fearing the German intelligence service was compromised by Omega Group, Samantha leaves the organization and goes rogue. She leaves Germany for Romania to find Captain Sergei Revinov, a member of Omega Group she believes can be turned. November 9, 1983, Omega Group launches Operatia Inversia, or Operation Inversion. Valentina leads this group, whose goal is to weaponize ExoElement 1, now called Ethereum, into something that could help the Soviet Union win the Cold War. November 11, 1983, Omega Group oversees the construction of a new facility led by Peck in Vietnam, called Outpost 25. November 13, 1983, the CIA receives the footage of End Station from Samantha and decides to authorize Operation Serbius. Requiem dispatches a strike team at the Project End Station facility where they discover the cyclotron and the portal to the dark ether. The strike team finds a modified computer where a stranger told them about his journey in the dark ether. They also stumble upon Orloff, the one's agent turned megaton, and partially resurrect him with Kurtz's decontamination chamber. Orloff warns them that Mega Group has big plans and decides to stay behind to ensure the rifts would be closing once and for all. They shut down the cyclotron and the strike team is exfilerated as the facility explodes. In the months following the destruction of the end station facility, more rifts appear across the world. January 8, 1984. At Outpost 25, Peck and Dr. Dmitry Kolkle create a rift between the Earth and the Dark Aether. Every day, teams of Omega soldiers cross the rifts to collect Ethereum, as well as samples from other materials from the Dark Aether. Peck notices that the Ethereum was a great source of energy and could be a sustainable power source. February 10, 1984. Outpost 25 now runs on three Ethereum reactors from Peck's design. February 15, 1984. The excursions to the Dark Aether to get Ethereum turn out to be dangerous for the Omega soldiers. Instead of sending its own people, Kravchenko recruits criminals, political dissidents, and other prisoners to become Ethereum miners, or Etheronauts. A quarter of the miners never come back from their trips to the Dark Aether. To give them more protection, Kolkley designs the Red Soldier mechanized armor. As their bodies are now protected, Peck looks for a way to preserve the Atheronauts' minds. He develops a memory transference machine and a truth serum, hoping it would restore the minds of those who become catatonic from the Dark Aether. March 14, 1984. Five more test sites open throughout the Soviet Union, with four having an active breach to the Dark Aether. March 19, 1984. Peck designs the first teleportation prototype at Outpost 25. The Soviet Union wants to weaponize this creation by teleporting a missile battery. April 8, 1984. Cole Clay develops an assault rifle powered with Ethereum called the RAI K84. Around the same time, Requiem also develops weapons with Ethereum, including a powerful bomb. They also create tools to investigate the dark ether in the Ural Mountains. May 11, 1984. The KGB decides on its target for Operatia Inversia. Despite Valentina's best efforts, Berlin is not a target. The Soviet Union will focus on Washington, D.C. and Manhattan, New York City. June 14, 1984. Samantha Maxis, who is now acting on her own, manages to turn Ravanov, a member of Omega Group. As she gets intel on their actions, Samantha realizes Omega Group is up to no good. She travels to Vietnam to infiltrate Omega and expose their plans, but she gets caught by Peck. 
Under the orders of Gorev, Kravinchenko's right-hand man and tactical operations lead, Peck captures Samantha and tortures her. When he finds out about the situation, Revanov reaches out to Weaver, a member of the CIA and a friend of Samantha. Weaver and the Requiem team launch Operation Lost Property to rescue Samantha and to get any intel they found in Vietnam. Under secret orders of the director of Requiem himself, Peck sends Samantha to the Dark Aether. She spends what seems like an eternity there, thinking about everything that happened and growing hatred against Peck day after day. June 15th, 1984. The dimensional breach at Outpost 25 releases large amounts of Ethereum, turning everyone into zombies. Peck manages to hide and call for rescue, and Revanoff secretly escapes in a nearby village. Everyone else is dead, or rather undead. With the help of Revanoff, a Requiem strike team reaches the facility through one of the teleporters. A big fight ensues, and Requiem manages to open a breach to get Samantha back from the Dark Aether. At Outpost 25, Kravinchenko is more than disappointed in Peck. To punish him, he draws his knife and cuts one of Peck's eyes. If Samantha was in the Dark Aether for only two days, her physiological and metabolical data indicate she spent several months there. She has changed, and this change is visible in her purple eyes. Samantha is judged unfit to go back to the field and stays several months locked inside Requiem HQ. June 20th, 1984. Requiem launches Operation Threshold, a massive project to get back Ethereum samples from the Ural outbreak zone. Omega Group also acts in this region, but the two opposing factions stay away from each other to prevent an escalation of the conflict. July 8th, 1984. Peck arrives at a missile silo in the Ural outbreak zone. His mission remains the same, complete Operatia Inversia and craft powerful Ethereum weapons to wipe out the West. July 14th, 1984. Peck manages to create reality inversion warheads using captured Tempest zombies to generate Ethereum. The warheads create a huge dimensional breach of over 500 meters and form an outbreak zone of over 800 kilometers. As a bonus for the Soviet Union, the electromagnetic interface generated by the Tempest interferes with the West's electronics, preventing them from detecting the warheads and firing back. July 22, 1984. Kravchenko takes the leadership of Operatia Inversia from Valentina. The director of Requiem himself secretly told Kravchenko that a threat bigger than the West was hiding in the dark ether. Instead of targeting Washington, D.C. or Manhattan, the reality inversion warheads are now aimed against this new enemy. August 16, 1984. Valentina receives a vision from the Forsaken, the one claiming to be her father. He says that all is not lost. His plans is still on and he has new instructions for her. On his end, Peck is still talking to a stranger through a modified computer. October 1984. Zikov, the scientist that went to the Dark Aether after closing the cyclotron in 1945, reappears. He reveals to Requiem that a gigantic evil army is gathering in the Dark Aether. It also seems he was the one to talk to Peck through the modified computer. November 16, 1984. Samantha uses her connections to secure a secret communication line with Requiem's strike team. She asks them to meet Revanoff in the missile silo and help him launch Operatia Inversia. Instead of aiming at the Dark Aether or Washington, D.C., the warheads are targeting the Pacific Ocean, where Samantha wants to throw them away. However, she needs to find the warheads' launch keys, and only the strike team could help with that. They manage to activate the warheads and escape, except for Revanoff. November 30th, 1984. The fiasco of Operatia and Versia causes a division among the Omega Group. Revanoff warns Weaver that several scientists, later known as the Omega-8, are ready to defect to Requiem. The CIA launches Operation Excision to recruit the defectors. At the same time, Kravinchenko tasks Dr. Hugo Jaeger to infiltrate the defecting scientists to eliminate them and set up a trap for the Requiem strike team. December 1st, 1984. Requiem decides to make additional tests on Samantha, who shows high levels of erythium contamination. The director of Requiem himself oversees the test to assess her powers. December 14th, 1984. Weaver tasks the strike team to meet Omega's defectors near a sanatorium. 
Unfortunately, the helicopter Karen Revanoff and the Omega-8 crashes and the scientists are nowhere to be found. They find a message from Jaeger saying that everyone was alive and took refuge a little further. However, when the strike team arrives at the meeting point, the scientists are all dead. Jaeger reveals he's a mole and takes possession of the Arathium Neutralizer, an invention from one of the dead scientists that prevents people from turning into zombies. Kravinchenko arrives at the site and captures the Requiem strike team. December 18, 1984. After two weeks of intense interrogation sessions led by the director of Requiem, Samantha snaps and uses her telekinetic abilities to break the glass in her room. She later realizes she is really powerful, with powers including telepathy, telekinesis, teleportation of objects, and creation of two-way portals. January 11, 1985. The KGB approves Operatia is Bavito, or Operation Deliverer. The goal of this new mission is to build a particle accelerator and dimensional amplifier to get Zykov out of the dark ether and get information about the Forsaken. And of course, use everything they can against the West. The KGB approves Operatia is Bavito, or Operation Deliverer. The goal of this new mission is to build a particle accelerator and dimensional amplifier to get Zykov out of the dark ether and get information about the Forsaken. January 22, 1985. Kravichenko reveals the plans of Operatia is Bavito to Gorov, Jaeger, and Peck. Zekov, through the modified computer, gets several schematics to Peck so he could build a device to help him escape from the Dark Aether and kill the Forsaken. However, Omega plans on capturing the Forsaken rather than killing him, because that would make too much sense. Peck builds a particle accelerator and dimensional amplifier. He also let the director of Requiem know about this operation. Late January 1985. After the failure of Operatia and Versia, Omega Group realizes Valentina had other goals than them and that she is the daughter of Ulrich Vogel. She leaves the organization and goes to her father's former lab beneath Berlin in the end station facility. There, she opens a portal to the Dark Aether to complete Operation Boulder and unleashes the Nazi army awaiting in the other dimension. February 2nd, 1985. Kravinchenko forces the strike team to stop Valentina and prevent the Nazi army from getting out of the Dark Aether. Meanwhile, Valentina crosses the portal to the Dark Aether and meets the one she calls her father. The stranger who calls himself the Forsaken congratulates her and tasks her with one final mission, to lead their army. Valentina comes back from the Dark Aether in a new scarlet body and sits on a floating throne she just created. She claims that the dawn of a new Reich is coming, as the undead Nazi army and other monsters pour out from the portal. After a long battle, the strike team finally defeats Valentina and strap her to a conversion machine built by her father. While Valentina was away in the dark ether, the strike team crafted an inversion warhead. All they need now is a large quantity of Arathium, which happens to be running through Valentina's veins. The strike team completes the inversion warhead, killing Valentina in the process. They then send the inversion warhead within the dark ether, closing the portal and the outbreak. February 9th, 1985. Peck localizes Zykov within the dark ether, but needs Omega to harness enough Arathium energy to get him out of there. March 19th, 85. The situation in the Ural outbreak zone is critical. With several portals pouring zombies into the area, new outbreak zones appear all around the world, notably in the Atlantic Ocean, Germany, Algeria, and Nebraska. March 28, 1985. Peck finishes the containment chamber for the Forsaken. He secretly adds a spherical device in the machine, following instructions from the director of Requiem. May 12, 1985. In response to Operatia is Vividal, Requiem launches Operation First Domino to find and secure Zykov before the Soviet Union gets him. May 28, 1985. Samantha joins Operation First Domino. The CIA believes that her powers will be useful for the fight to come, but forbids her from returning to the field. She would stay at the Requiem facility and open a portal for the strike team when needed. June 4th, 1985. Peck and Krevinchenko are finally ready to capture the Forsaken. As they are running several tests, an unexpected dimensional breach appears in the facility. 
The breach consumes everyone in the facility, except for Peck and Kravinchenko. Despite the mess, Kravinchenko doesn't want Peck to close the breach before they could get Zykov. Soon after, the Requiem strike team arrives from a portal created by Samantha. Zykov finally emerges from the dark ether, but turns out to be the Forsaken himself. As he proceeds to destroy the world, Samantha joins the fight and uses her powers to temporarily counter the Forsaken. The strike team and Peck build a device called the Crystal Axe to break the Forsaken's barrier and reach him. They turn on the device while Samantha uses her power to activate Ethereum gun turrets and fire at the Forsaken to expose its core. The Dark Aether entity doesn't appreciate assaults and counterattacks. Samantha sacrifices herself and dives into the Forsaken's core, sealing herself in the Dark Aether. This weakens the Forsaken long enough to be captured into the spherical device of Peck's machine. With this capture, the dimensional breaches all around the world begin to lessen and collapse. The current Call of Duty Zombies story ends with the character it began with, Richtofen. Not Primus, Ultimus, Undead, or even post-war Richtofen, but simply Eddie. The child who survived the Aether story became the director of Requiem. He sends the strike team to a black site for indefinite containment and shuts down Requiem. With Samantha trapped in Dark Aether, again, he is now free to continue his mysterious Project Deanus. The story of Call of Duty Vanguard is a prequel to the Dark Aether story. It focuses on the story of the Elder Gods from the Dark Aether. We will have to wait a little longer to know what happens to Eddie Richtofen and what lies behind Project Yanis. Thank you for watching this video. The story of Call of Duty Zombie Mode is quite long and complex, but I hope this will help you better understand what is going on in the games. What is your favorite moment in Call of Duty Zombie's story? Let us know in the comments. And as usual, make sure to like this video and check out our channel for more gaming content.